Well, Luton Hoo makes a superb location for us and also gives you the opportunity to enjoy the myriad colours of the Antiques Roadshow on a fine day like today. Also, we're not only using the house, as you can see, but also the gardens on the south face of the mansion. So, let's now join our experts with the people of Bedfordshire. Now, this is Captain Edward Cook. Um, his voyage to the South Sea and round the world, performed in the years 1708, 1709, 10 and 11. Now, the interesting thing about this voyage, um, one of the few circumnavigations at this date, was that, if you look at the bottom here, wherein an account is given of Mr. Alexander Selkirk, his manner of living and taming of some wild beasts during the four years and four months he lived upon an uninhabited island of Juan Fernandez. Now, this particular account of Alexander Selkirk gave somebody else back in England, Daniel Defoe, uh, the idea for his Robinson Crusoe. This chap, Alexander Selkirk, was the original Robinson Crusoe. So this was printed in 1712, and I think uh, Robinson Crusoe came out in 1719 or something like that, so he had a few years to write it. Um, it's not in terribly good condition, but it, it does show some very interesting points. It shows their route all the way around the world. They came down from England, down to the South Atlantic, down here, round the bottom of Tierra del Fuego, up the side of America, to California. California at this stage is still shown as an island. Nobody had I gone round the top yes. and actually shown that, in fact, this bit was attached to that bit. Amazing. Anyway, from the bottom of California, they made a quick shoot straight across the Pacific, going straight through to the East Indies, Madagascar, Cape of Good Hope, and home. Now, this map is, in fact, complete. It does need restoring, putting, laying down together, but it is all there, so that's one major important thing when one's looking at a book like this. The other thing is to look at the rest of the book and see what it's like. Um, it's very, very worn here. This is damp staining, I think, all this damp mould. Not terribly good condition there. But all this can be restored, and quite easily, I think. Where did you get this? Why is it in such bad condition? What have you done with it? Well, it's such a super book, and I mean, a wonderful thing. The story is, my husband's boss uh, lived in some cottages and uh, they decided they want to pull them down, so they pulled them down to build a new house and then in the rubble, underneath everything, were lots of things and included was the book, so they didn't buy it, they just well, found it. Now, th isn't this, this is, this, is, this is amazing, this shows you how good 18th century binding and paper really is. Well, the book that actually made Defoe write Robinson Crusoe, in this condition, I would have to say it's worth 300 to 400 pounds. Oh, that's super. Jolly good. Thank yeah. you for bringing it in. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, the popular name for these, of course, is the Wellington Chest. Yes. Something of a misnomer, I don't think Wellington introduced it at all, actually. It's actually a Semenier chest, a French idea, where you had seven drawers for fresh linen uh, each day of the week. And no doubt, during the campaigns, he uh, discovered this and brought it back to England. So the story goes, anyway. Nevertheless, Wellington Chest is what it's called. And it's a jolly good example. They're nearly always uh, walnut uh, or rosewood. This case is a walnut, a nice burr veneer running down the front. Good quality. Always leaf-capped at the top here. The earliest ones are about 1825, 1830. They don't appear much before that. And they were very popular, and they were made right up until the 1880s, 1890s. This one bank smack in the middle, I'd say about 1850, really. Oh, right. How did you come by? Is it a family piece? or? Yes, it was a family piece. Um, it belonged to an aunt who inherited it from her great-grandmother. Yeah. And um, when she moved, she couldn't accommodate it, so we bought it off of her. The nice thing about them always is this sort of unique lock here. Mm. That has to open before... Uh, you can open any of the drawers. Yes. Big panic in our house when somebody lost the key. Oh you can't get anything. <laughs> um, and they are usually plain drawers, and the reason why I wanted to look at this one is because it does have something special, which is this, which lifts it out of the ordinary to the quite exceptional. It turns it into a little gentleman's dressing chest. Very, very unusual to find a nice little secretaire fall like this. Um, it's also a nice feature that these are self-supporting hinges rather than the rather more ugly uh, quadrants that you see sometimes on the bigger pieces. Very smart, beautiful quality brass work on here. Little burr maple drawers, nice little shaping here. I wonder how much you pay for you. You bought it, you say, you had to buy it in the family. Oh, I bought it in the family, yes. Uh, I paid £200 for it. Did you? Did you? So it was about eight years ago. 
Well, you did all right. I mean, you'll still be friends with the family when I tell them that uh, it's probably worth 1800 to 2000 today. Oh. <laughs> the ordinary ones make about twelve to 1500 The draw, as I say, makes it a bit special. Jolly nice one. Very right. good. Well done. Thank you. Do you know what it is? What would you do with Absolutely that? Absolutely no idea. It was a gift from my grandmother, but I don't know quite where oh. it originated from. I've got a piece of paper. One always loves pieces of paper because they're always wrong. It says on it, I got at rye. This, or something like that, Sev Royal Period, 1753. This is actually um, a custard cup. You actually ate custard with a spoon out of it. Because in the 18th century, custard was perhaps more like you would call creme brulee. I mean, it was a, a, a sweet thing. Special. Tinge. Yeah. Uh, not as we know custard today. Uh, and it certainly appears to be Sèvres. We've got on the bottom here um, the Sèvres mark, which is the interlaced L's of the Louis. Right. Louis XV set the factory up, and then it passed to Louis XVI before the revolution. It was founded, actually, at a, a disused chateau called Vincennes. And it was founded about 1745. And then in 1753, they introduced a date coding system. And they put a little letter A in the middle of the letter. So A was 53, B 54, C 55, and so on. So we can date every piece of Sèvres porcelain accurately. Now, it was a royal factory. It had tremendous prestige. Um, Sèvres was always collected by the English. I mean, the Prince of Wales, um, Prinny, as he was called, later George IV, terrible man. Um, he was a great collector of it, and the Queen's got a wonderful collection of Sèvres porcelain. So it was always highly regarded. And if something is highly regarded, somebody else is going to come along and start uh, making it. And this is French, yes, but it's nothing to do with Sèvres. It was made in Paris, probably in the 1920s to 1930s. Really? So it is actually a forgery. Right. The pattern is, is close to a Sèvres one, but the quality of the workmanship is not good enough, but pretty enough and worth about 30 to 40 pounds. Quite a story to it. Good story to it. I like the bit of paper particularly, <laughs> even though it's wrong. Um, and finally, this teapot. This we call Mandarin palette with this particular purpley uh, pink to it. This was an export ware teapot made for consumption in Europe and sent over from uh, China. And it's really a rather wonderful piece of workmanship. The painting is very good indeed. So is the gilding. The crab stock handle is quite typical and spout. And would you have known that it was Chinese? Uh, I did wonder, but I wasn't certain. Right. Yes. There's actually a rather good way of telling whether you're dealing with a Chinese teapot or a Japanese teapot, and that's to look underneath the handle. You see that hole? Yes. Chinese teapots are hollow, and the hole is to let the air out when it's being fired. And you don't find that on Japanese teapots, and almost never on uh, European ones either. Once upon a time, was it actually made? For, for, use. for use. This would have come across from China with an entire service of milk jugs, sucre, possibly even a tea caddy, and it's unusual for it to have survived. Date about 1760. As old as that? Yes, as old as that. Nice thing. Um, given there's a bit of damage to it, that's going to be worth around 150 to 200 pounds. Goodness me. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing it in. One snake. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the most unpleasant things I've ever seen on the road. <laughs> How did you get it? Well, my father was um, in Palestine during the Great War, and his unit left Palestine in either 1919 or early yeah. 1920. And this snake was in the battle, and he won the battle on the night that they left. They he must had have been. His, his, his emotions must have been mixed. <laughs> I think he I think A so. won the raffle and B, this is what yes. he got. What he got. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You've obviously got one or two condition problems with it. It seems to have bitten the head off its lizard, which is unfortunate. Yes. The value of it is difficult because there's a limited number of households who wish to have one of these on their sideboard. <laughs> well, I'm <hope> a <laughs> um, I would think if he came up in an auction, 
as an amusing novelty more than an antique, he was going to be worth somewhere around about two or three hundred pounds. Oh, oh yes, I mean a lot of hand work's gone into this. Big effort. So I think you're going to have to start being much more polite about it. Yes. You're going to have to have it back on the sideboard. Yes. And the bad news is you're going to have to reattach the head of the lizard. I'm going to have to, yes. I'm going to, have to work on him properly this time, not just cobble him up. <laughs> Quite an extraordinary pile of drawings, this. They're rather good. Where did you get them? Uh, I rescued them from a demolition man's bonfire, actually. Did you? About 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Well, they were just <coughs> clearing a house. Clearing a house. And, uh, yeah, they would have been chucked. Yeah. The interesting thing is that normally when you see great piles of works, they're um, not very good, but these are really marvellous, I think. Well, I expect you're wondering what you can do with them. don't know what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 what I'd like, I'd, actually, I'd, I'd like the artist to get some kind of recognition, really, because... Uh, well, he's called Hope, Hope Reed, and the, there's a li I mean, he did exhibit a little bit, but um, I think what, what I would recommend is to find a small dealer who will put together an excellent exhibition, price them right, in other words, not too high, uh, and I'm sure that they'd sell like hotcakes, because they're marvellous. So there's no good me keeping them forever, is there? I've got, I've got about ten on my wall now, so <laughs> giving a few away. And, uh, yeah, well, actually, they're jolly nice presents, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they've, they've done well for wedding presents. <laughs> and I've had it since about 1930. Right. Matter of fact, an ex-boyfriend brought it for me. Good heavens. Why did you become an ex-boyfriend? Well, because I finished with it. Oh dear. But it missed... husband. Ah, but you kept the Clarice clip? Well, he didn't want it back, so I kept it. So you had these, effectively, from new? Yeah, yeah, yes. Clarice Cliff, of course, was one of the great designers of the 1930s. She started in 1929, and during the 30s, these bizarre and fantastic patterns were increasingly popular. Uh, I think because they captured the spirit of the age. These are very successful patterns. Um, the crocus pattern, I think you, you, you know as well, yes. which is the most popular. Um, but these pieces with their bright oranges, their bright greens, um, were absolutely the most typical of her work. And of course, this rather fantasy landscape that was very characteristic of the style, with the, the path going through the trees, these oh, yes. fantastic sort of balloon trees. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be more Clarence Cliff like than this. Now, of course, Clarence Cliff today, I'm sure you're aware, is, is very desirable. Um, do you remember what they cost when he oh, no bought idea. them for you? Nothing at all. No Shillings, all. presumably. A jar like this, though, you would be probably thinking about five, six hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, with the lid damaged, the, the, the value is less. Yes. We're talking probably about three or four hundred pounds. A single plate like this um, fetches now 150 up to 200 pounds. So your inheritance, if that's the word for it, yes. has done you proud. Mm -hmm. um, even though the relationship that encouraged it at the time has... I'd have to let him know about them, No, I think you'd better keep, keep it a secret in case he asks for them back after all these years. Yes. Wow. Look at that. Fantastic. Very early post-war television set. Which one of you is the owner? Well, my uncle gave it to me, and um, I've been looking after it since then. So you were the original purchased, purchaser, yes. were you? Well, now tell me, when did you buy it? I bought it at Tottenham Court Road. I bought it for my parents. And um, when was it? it? Must have been what, 1946, 46, 47, 46. 46. And it was um, the original Logie Bear and. Um, Jack Buchanan at the time was the director. That's right. Jack Buchanan and John Logie Baird were great friends, Thanks. and they set up this company just after the war, and they produced four wonderful television sets, and they were called The Adelphi, The Lyric, which is what this is, The Grosvenor, and The Athena, I think it was. This, in television collector's terms is thought to be the best of them all because not only was it technically very good but also artistically stylistically it was very advanced and a beautiful object to look at and they were very expensive now I know that in some shops the lyric was retailed at about 235 pounds now what was the price of a car then 100 pounds or under so it was the price of house. two and a half saloon cars. You were a very good son, weren't you? Yes. Amazing. The history, really, of television is quite remarkable in England because in 1936 it was the first domestic service anywhere in the world. 
and it was only for a few people. I mean, Alexandra Palace, although it had a, a, a catchment area, if you like, of about uh, 2,000 square miles, very, very few people could afford to buy a television set. And it stopped broadcasting, stopped obviously in 1939, and in 1946, up it started again. And that's when John Logie Baird and Jack Buchanan produced these wonderful sets. And in 1948, they started another broadcasting station in Sutton Coldfield, just in time for the Olympic Games. And that's really when television set ownership became much more popular. This was still from the period when it was very much a luxury item. Now, did your parents know anybody else who had one? No. I'm sure, in, in their yeah. area, it must in have been... In their area, we were, I think we were the only one. One most popular house in the street. I'm sure <laughs> you could charge everybody for entry. But what I'd like to do, if I may, is to turn it round and just have a look at the, the bag, because that will tell us a little bit more about it. Here we go. The John Logie Baird Limited yes. name tag on there. Now, I'm pleased to see it's unplugged, <laughs> so I'm going to risk taking the back off. Let's just have a look in there. Oh, this is, look at this. This is wonderful. Um, it hasn't been cleaned. Can you cleaned. turn this back so that it's... I drop that. That's it. Look at this sort of no, nice, we, we, wonderful build-up of 1940s dust. <laughs> we dare not touch it. Is it working? Have you tried it? The tube is live. I've turned it on once, but it was right. advised not to do it because it yes. could blow it. Yes. Um, yes. It isn't working because I haven't replaced the valves. Well, wonderful to see the inside there. This is undoubtedly a Rolls-Royce. However, because more and more were made of them, it means that the originals haven't really kept pace with inflation. So it's not going to be worth the price of two family saloons, I'm afraid, but it is worth something. And I would have thought we're talking about perhaps between two and a half and maybe as much as five thousand pounds i know that's a very big gap but collectors are few and far between and the interest is really only just growing and i'm very pleased that you brought it thank you very much I'm indeed pleasure thank you i purchased it years ago in the sale just because you liked it well yeah it's quite a strange a rather pretty family group, but there is a, a cautionary tale which I wish to tell about the artist. His name is Edward George Handel Lucas. His father was a poor tailor in Croydon. At age 17, the young Lucas exhibited an extraordinary still life at the Royal Academy and became a celebrated artist in Croydon. However, it all did not go too well because to do a picture this size in the 1870s, he took up to 16 months. So immaculately did he paint it. And because of this, he soon went broke. He got to a stage where he couldn't pay his rent. So he owed the landlady 60 pounds, and he had a family to support. And so he said, I'll paint you a picture. But it took him so long to paint the picture, the landlady couldn't wait and evicted them. So it's a really sad story because he's a beautiful artist. Now, this picture, in fact, is dated 1930 which again is very interesting because here he is 60 years old, but he'd already, he'd long before given up painting. So I imagine that there can only be two reasons for this picture. Either he was broke again and desperate to make some money, or I think much more likely, I'm sure, that this is one of his daughters and family. And you can see how the young Handel Lucas was influenced by the Pre-Raphaelites, by these pure, pure glazes on a white ground. I don't think it's a very expensive picture, eight to 1,200 pounds, something like that. But you can see in the details, the young Handel Lucas recreated age 60. And I think it's a beautiful work. Okay. Is this something you bought or where did they come from? No, my aunt had got them stored in a coal shed and I begged them from her and she kindly gave them to me. Uh, they, they are in fact, the library steps from uh, Langley Berry House. Oh, that's just, it's just up the road here. That's right, it? in West Hertfordshire, actually. They are absolutely magnificent. The thing is about these, they have been so widely reproduced recently that when you see them coming in today, you think, can they really be the genuine article? They are made of beech, and if you look at the varnish on them, it's gone all crackly, and of course that couldn't possibly be reproduced. Do you use them? Have you got a marvellous library that you stand them up and climb up and look at your books? I would like to think so, but I really don't have it used like that. In fact, most people think it's a soil pipe on the wall in the house. 
Why, where do you have them? On the landing. On the landing? It's the only part of the house tall enough to put it in. Oh, but that's such a shame you should use them. <laughs> they are so lovely. And they, of course, I mean, they are highly collectible. The fact that they close up so neatly. And uh, if I told you they were worth about uh, two and a half thousand pounds? I'd be amazed. <laughs> well, that's what they would cost you if you wanted to go and try and buy some. And in fact, uh, if Goodness. they were mahogany, they would cost even more. Well, the nice thing is she's got these marvellous eyes that you look at the wax doll eyes and they're always beautifully done with the pupils and everything, all delineated. It's lovely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's sort of slightly, slightly creepy, but she is just in very bad shape. The trouble is with um, wax dolls tend not to make the same sort of money as porcelain headed dolls. And the moment you have damage on a wax doll, it wipes out the value even further. Um, there is a doll's hospital that you can send them to to get them. What they do is they remelt them and join them back together so that you won't even be able to see any damage on it at all. And I really think it's worth doing because she's wonderful. She's got all her original clothes. It just seems such a shame, really, to have something that's in that sort of condition. Is the other one the same? This one is the younger one, the German one, I think. Mm -hmm. But what happened was the mildew got its feet. <laughs> the mildew got her feet? Ghastly fate. Oh, it has to. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it's given And I had to wash all the clothes and everything. It's the most advanced case of athletes yeah. I've ever seen. <laughs> Deary me. Well, what's happened is it's just that the glue's come undone, hasn't yeah. it? I mean, the joints have just completely come apart. Now, in perfect condition, um, she would be worth somewhere around about £475. So the, the answer is yes, it's definitely worth getting her feet put back on. There's a fascinating collection that you've got here, but um, how, how did you get it together? My husband's grandfather collected them when he was librarian and curator in Blackburn Museum. Um, right. It, it really does show beautifully, in, in a sense, what a museum curator really would do, which shows the whole development of the spoon. Because what we do is go from the early English form here, which is a type that you get from about 1300 through to the mid-17th century, this one actually early 17th century, Sadly, though, that one not in good condition. I mean, had that one been a decent spoon, then we'd be looking at maybe 500 pounds. As it is, 100, 120 is, a, is about it. But then radical change in the second half of the 17th century, and we get the spoon changing to what is much more familiar type. Starts with the trefid, as we see here. Uh, it's called that, actually, because of the the two cuts there. But if you notice the initials are on the back. Yes. Because all of these spoons from about 1660 through to about 1760 were set that the way I, I, I've put them on the table here, that's the way they went on the table. Then from the trefid they stopped cutting the notches and you get this wavy end. And that is very much the one the, the spoon of the reign of Queen Anne. And they're known as wavy end, shield end, or most often dog nose. But then, about 1720, they rounded off the end, mm -hmm. so you get to the Panamaria, yes. and that rounded off end continues through to 1760. Mm -hmm. But the rat tail that we saw there, that continues up to 1730. Then the rat tail disappears, That's right, yes. and you get this little drop. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, as we've got there, a double drop. And also, because they'd lost the rat tail, they, they started to decorate the back so you get the shell backs. Really Value-wise, for rat tails in good condition, at about 50, 60 pounds. Without the rat tails, they're going to be more the sort of 40, 50 pound bracket. The shell backs, those go up again because people do collect those specifically. Maybe 120, 150 pounds for the pair. But notice the important difference, how we go from that one that way and this one turning yes. up. And that happened in 1760. And from there on, spoons, nearly all spoons, turn that way. Is it, I'm so pleased that you brought it in because it's particularly from 1660 through to 1760, it shows marvellously the development of the spoon over that, that hundred year span. Thank you Thank very you much very indeed. Much. Thank you. One of the things you discover about beautiful country houses like this is that not everything is quite what it seems. Take these five clocks, for instance, each one of them magnificent and they would grace any country house such as this. But Simon, I gather they're rather more beautiful than they are practical. 
Yes, I, I wouldn't want to denigrate their timekeeping abilities, but certainly the reason that they're here is for their looks and for, for their decorative qualities. Well, starting at the end, this wonderful clock. This is a very famous clock. It's in all the books and illustrated. It's an, what's known as one of the Orpheus series of clocks. It's actually got an astrolabe on the top here. It's supposed to be able to tell you the position of the stars at any time of the year. But you'd be very lucky if you could get it to keep time within, say, half an hour to an hour a day. But its case is absolutely magnificent. It actually tells the story of Orpheus, who's able to charm the animals. Mm -hmm. And it's late 16th century, 15, 1570, 1580. And of course, you're looking at animals as the engraver would have seen them from engravings. Nobody had seen an elephant at that time, and this is made in Germany. It is a sensational piece, it's a wonderful isn't it? clock. whether it kept time or not. And, and then the next, next to it is another clock of the same pitch, tremendously powerful, it's wonderful engraving and chasing. And here you can see that 150 years after it was made, which again is the end of the 16th century, they've tried to improve its timekeeping abilities by fitting a pendulum, which when you, when you stand and look at it, you can realize it sort of chops the whole clock yeah. about. Yeah. It, it was a, a, an attempt to, to improve timekeeping. This, of course, is exactly where it should be. This lives here. It's a magnificent French clock from the middle of the 18th century, made by the royal clockmaker Robin. It probably had a pair of urns or something beside it. And then finally... Well, these two, I think, are really something quite special, aren't well, they? Well, they're from the Fabergé collection here at Luton Hoo, and, of course, the Werner family were directly connected with the great Russian family, and a lot of the collection came directly absolutely. from Fabergé's workshops. Yes, and Luton Hoo is famous for its collection of Fabergé. Here we have pictures of the royal the family there of Russia, the Tsar, and these were given out almost like spaghetti. If you look in Fabergé's workshop books, it's the Duchess of this, the Tsar of that, and there's hundreds and hundreds of Easter was the great time of year, eggs and, and these beautiful clocks, which I think there's probably half a dozen or more here. And this, this one, a poignant reminder of the fact that, of course, they were all shot. Yes. Where do you think this might have been made? I think China. You think China? Yes. OK. Have, has anybody told you anything about it? Um, my friend who bought it, I bought it off of, she told me it was uh, Victorian, and another man told me it could be Chinese Edwardian. Uh, you bought it off a friend? What, yes. How long ago? Um, about three <clears throat> years ago. Um, it was handed down to her from her grandmother, uh -huh. and she didn't like it. And um, I said to her, when you want to sell it, I said, can I, you know, I'd like <clears throat> it. And um, she had someone in to value it, and they said it, no, it cost too much to get it restored. Do you know how much it was going to cost to restore? He said he'd be about <clears throat> £600 to restore it. Wow. And he, he wasn't really interested in it. He said he'd, be, he'd give her two, about £250 for it. So she said I could have it for £50. Generous. Yes, and um, so we paid, uh, I think it was about £150 to get it restored to this, to like this. And, um, and he told us it could be worth something. Something? Yes. OK, well, let's try and get it sorted out. The panels are Japanese. And it's quite nice. They've used different kinds of lacquered background to do each different one, which mm. is just sort of showing off their techniques. Mm. This is, again, these are rather more unusual as well because they've built up relief um, for this pine tree rather cleverly. But my feeling is that these have all come from a screen. They were not mounted in a piece of furniture when they were made. And these were done at the end of the last century, beginning of this, about 1900. Either the screen fell apart or it was too big or they didn't like it or whatever. And rather than chuck the panels away, which would have been a shame, they built a cabinet round it. Round the panels, yeah. And the cabinet was built in this country in about 1930. And the clue to, I mean, they've got this sort of asymmetrical layout, which you would expect from a Japanese thing. And this, of course, is more Chinese than Japanese. Mm. And this kind of angular key fretting, and this sort of Art Deco radio design, uh, dates it quite easily to the 1930s. The clue to the fact that it's probably English is that. That's an English lock and has in fact got English writing on it, stamped into it. Um, it's in pretty good condition. Um, I think if this were to appear at auction, in perhaps a country auction, um, it would probably make somewhere around uh, four to six hundred pounds, something like mm. that. But it's a wonderful muddle. Yeah, that's, that's the best right. thing yes, about it. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much.
Now, before we start anything, tell me, is, has this been deactivated? Yes. And have you got a piece of paper to prove it? Yes, yes. Excellent. Secondly, are the cartridges that are in this belt that are about to be pulled into the breach, are they dummies? Yes, they are. Splendid, right. This is a Vickers medium machine gun, the sort of weapon that was used for infantry support from the late 1890s until amazingly 1962. We plonk the sight up, you can see on the back of it, it goes out to 2,900 yards, which is you know, quite a good, good way away. But mo mostly they, they were used up to ranges of about 1,000 yards for actually engaging direct targets, like a, a line of attacking infantry. And, and the concept of a machine gun that one man could carry about really didn't come in until the end of the First World War. It's a lovely gun in, in beautiful condition and uh, presumably it must have cost you a pretty penny. Yeah. What did you pay for it? Um, 490. Well, that, that's the going rate for them at the moment. And bearing in mind that they, there are no more being made, at some stage they're going to start to go up in value. And that they're an amazingly good piece to sort of form a collection around. If you have a gun room and you have that smack in the middle of it, it really gets people's attention. You must have a very large bedroom. Uh, yes, so stuck in the middle of it. Yeah. It takes up part of it. Well, it was painted by my great uncle by marriage. He married my um, grandmother's sister, and his name was Philip de Laszlo. He was a Hungarian, and he painted this picture of his wife and gave it to my grandmother as a present. Yes, it's inscribed here. Now, that is your grandmother's name, is that right? Yes, her name was Constance, and he yes. referred to her as Connolly. Connolly, from Philip, and I think the date here is 1901. And as you said, he was um, born in Budapest and trained in Budapest and also in uh, Paris and Munich. And then came and settled in London mm. in the early years and became one of the most successful of the Society of Portrait Painters. I think it wasn't just his painting, but also his personality, yes. which um, brought the whole thing off so very well. It's uh, particularly appropriate that uh, we have a de Laszlo portrait uh, brought to the show here because in this house and in fact this very room we have a wonderful full-length portrait of Lady Werner who was the former owner of the house. Now I think what's particularly nice about this um, small portrait is that it is actually unfinished. He's concentrated in oil just on the profile and the hair and just sketched in the hat here and the shoulders. I mean, some artists would probably go there and they might make a preparatory drawing in black lead and then even draw on chalk onto the, uh, onto the board, but he's just gone straight to the canvas, kind of uninhibited and just painted what he saw. Uh, what he saw. And of course, this was his um, great skill. Um, on the question of value, I think it's uh, particularly important being the artist's wife, and perhaps if it was of an unknown, I don't think it would be particularly valuable, shall we say, some 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. But because it's the artist's wife, I think I can, we can put that figure considerably higher and probably say between uh, four and 5,000 pounds. Does that surprise mm. you, or perhaps it doesn't? It does surprise me slightly, but I suppose because it is of his wife, it's it makes, more important. It makes all the um, difference. Yes. Yes. They are Chinese bluemite plates, obviously, in the second half of the 18th century. And the quality of the painting is extremely good. It's very fine, isn't it, you see? Yes. It's wonderfully drawn. Most people have a pair of plates, plates or one yeah. dish or something. How do, how well, do you I get the quantity? My parents were very fortunate. Lord Thin used to own a big house in the village they lived in. Which was where? Which was Haynes in Bedfordshire. And uh, shortly before the war, I, th I think um, the lady that owned the home, who was an, an ex-relative of the Thins, mm. died and her estate was put in abeyance during the war. And then after the war, the house and the total contents was put up for auction. And they went to view it. And my father put in a bid before the auction took place for the complete What was the name contents. of the house again? It was the old house. Right. I think it was called um, Crothwaite in the The reason, only reason I know about Thin is that there was a wonderful service made during the first period, Worcester period, Dr. Wall, so-called Dr. Wall period, a service which is known as the, um, I think it's called the Lord Henry Thin service. Mm -hmm. And it's beautifully painted with wonderful landscapes, all different. Oh. 
and they're very sought after and very, very expensive indeed. Anyway, come to the pieces themselves, discarding that because that we know is, another, is a part of another service. This, of course, is a strainer which goes with this meat dish. I can do it like so. The condition, according to your list, is also extremely good. You mm -hmm. say 34 dinner plates, mm -hmm. and you say three damaged. Yes. Which, so you've got... Quite a few. <laughs> so you've got 31 mint plates. And if, if each plate, say, is worth, like, like that, is worth, I don't know, 60 to 100 pounds, let's say a mean figure of 70 pounds, you, you want to add the figures up. So you had 31 dinner plates of this in good condition. You had 19 soup plates, three oval platters, 18 and a half inches, mm -hmm three more oval platters, it's the most marvellous export service, obviously made, say, during the Emperor Chen Long's period. Mm. And I think it's worth quite a lot. I think you'd have to think in terms of somewhere in the order of seven to perhaps nine thousand pounds. Oh, goodness. <laughs> See what I mean? Yes. This is the greatest treasure I've seen all day. Very old, beautifully kept. A bit dirty, but so what? It hasn't got any chips, it hasn't got any damage. It's a cracker of an item. Oh. Tell me about it. Well, it just came in a junk box, and I thought at first the top was missing, but I eventually found the top, and that's how, that's and how it came. put the two back together? Put the two back together. Well, did you know what it was for? I had no idea it was for snuff. <laughs> well, it is, it is for snuff. It's made of wood. It comes under the field called treen. Anything made out of wood is called treen in the collector's trade. I see, yeah. And people have become wildly excited about shoes. Now, shoes are always collectible, but particularly when they're made of wood like this. And what we've got here is a little Georgian shoe and endless decoration around the side. Nice. Somebody has taken such That's a lot right. of trouble on this. I think if you were to go home and give this a bit of care and attention, a Clean bit of a it. brush up with just some gentle wax, it would start to glow and shine, That's it would right. start to look like metal. And I think if this was then to appear in an auction room, you could expect anything, six, seven hundred pounds. Never. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. I mean, you've got a real treasure here. It's terribly wow. exciting. It's one of those Victorian pieces, unmistakably Victorian because it's such a mixture, that comes from a period of the, the Italianate Renaissance. Now, it looks as if it could have been made in Italy, but it wasn't. Yeah. It's an English-made piece. Ah. Um, and it would date from about 1880, maybe 1875, up to yeah. about 1890, 1895. Oh. That's when it was made, as far as the structure's concerned. Yeah. Um, it depends on if you've got any family history to back that up. I mean, any knowledge on it at all? Well, it belonged to my grandmother. Right. Um, and I inherited it. And it's been in the family about 50 years now. Well, it was obviously made long time before that. Um, I think it's worth looking at, at the amazing detail and also the contrasting colours that you've got with this boxwood and ivory. I'm going to open this drawer. You see that shadow, yeah. it's, it's almost black, that rosewood. Imagine yeah. that when the boxwood itself was bright gold, the ivory was white. Yeah. I mean, it must yeah. have absolutely stunning with yeah. these Sheffield plate handles. They're yeah. not silver, you can just see the nickel coming oh, through. Oh. You've then got a carved frieze of the finest quality, really deep cutting, and it's solid rosewood. And then if you come up to the, the upper part, You've got these nice sort of places here to stand a pair of vases or figures. Yeah. Amazing quality. And the thing I've never seen before, oh. I've never seen before, is this carving which is inlaid into a lighter background. Oh, yeah. So this is actually two separate types of timber. Now, there is one thing about this that does make it stand out different yeah. Yeah. from the majority of these museum or exhibition pieces which were made from the 1850s, 1860s onwards. And that is the name of the maker. And here you've got, just faintly stamped in there, Gillow and Co. Gillow, yeah. Now, Gillow's was one of the oldest firms that we can trace back to the 1690s. Really? Yeah. And they were one of the few English makers who actually stamped their wares. Uh, I think the Gillow family actually eased out of the company by the sort of 1830s. And by the end of the century, of course, it was wearing a Gillow. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Well, that was the same people. Oh, was it? Now, the Gillow stamp makes a lot of difference. So, now we come down to the, the big question. Have you got it insured at all? No, okay. only on the house insured. Right. Well, you need to improve that because without the Gillow stamp, you're looking at several thousand pounds. Uh -huh. With that Gillow stamp and the condition that it's in, which is extremely good, extremely good, then you ought to insure this between ten and twelve thousand. Really? Mm -hmm. oh, it's very surprising that, yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. But it's a lot of cabinet. Yeah. 
I must say, I always thought that men's straw hats were made in Panama, or at least somewhere in South America. Wrong, I was told today. Luton is the centre of hat making and uh, straw hats as well. Even the local football team is known as the Hatters, and I'm told Luton is to hats what Northampton is to shoes. And here is the evidence to prove it, kindly loaned to us by Luton Museum. Now, this is a particularly rare example. It's about 1770, made actually not of straw, although it looks it. It's made of paper, said to have belonged to the Duchess of Somerset. This is known as a hat of fancy, made about a hundred years later, of straw trimmed in velvet, made in Luton. This is a cloche hat, it's actually made of muslin. The decoration is embroidered sisal twine. And this magnificent example, finally, is a policeman's helmet, and these were worn commonly by the Luton police until 1937. That is in the summer, of course, and we know that that one belonged to a PC Dunn. So there we are, the history of hat making in Luton. Now, I particularly hope that you'll join us next week at the same time because we have the first of our roadshow specials. Inevitably, in these programmes, we see more people and more antiques than we can possibly include. So we're saving some of those moments from today's programme and indeed previous editions in this series to show you in that special next week. So until then, from all of us at Luton Who, goodbye. <laughs>